social network. It's really more complex than we have time to get into. Uh, but we are here. Of course, I'm joined by uh, Tom Hollingsworth uh, over here, and we're going to be running down your IT news of the week in the Gestalt IT rundown. A bigger news of, uh, or a bigger week of news than last week, I think. Last week, there were some interesting kind of continuing um, narratives. There were some updates and stuff like that. But this week, there is some, some pretty solid news, Tom. So I am excited uh, to cover it with you, of course, as always. Yeah, I am too. I think everybody was just waiting last week until we uh, recorded the rundown and then they decided to release all their news. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, again, I'm, it's, it's good that they're at least talking about us. That's really all I can ask for. Um, the, the only reaction you don't want is apathy. Uh, so we can, uh, we can get going. So, Tom, are you ready to get the show started? Yes. All right. So let's get it going in three, two, one. Hello, all, and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, your weekly look at the IT News of the Week. I'm your host, Rich Straffolino. I'm an editor with Gestalt IT. Joining me from across this great land of ours is the one, the only, the networking nerd himself, Tom Hollingsworth. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Rich. It's another wonderful day here in my, um, well, my rundown cave. <laughs> the, uh, the den of uh, networking is what I'm going to call it. Um, sure. But uh, uh, from that uh, location, which I mean, we've disclosed is is it at least in Oklahoma. So we've narrowed it down to one of 50 states. Um, but with some anonymity, Tom, are you ready to do a little something we like to call news or not? Uh, yes, I am. All right. This is where we have just too many stories to cover in full discussion length, or maybe they we, we, we haven't determined if they just warrant a full discussion. And that's why we have news or now. I get Tom's take on if they are in fact newsy or not. Uh, Tom, I'm excited to let's get go. Uh, we talked about Google Cloud earnings last week, but we got the other two players of the big three public cloud providers. And AWS, Azure, and GCP, they all published their earnings. In terms of growth, Azure grew the most at 59% in terms of revenue uh, on the year. Google, though, was up 52% like we discussed last week, although interestingly not leading the pack. I think that's what we were waiting to determine with those earnings. And Amazon grew 33%. Well, Amazon still has a substantial lead in overall revenue with $10 billion in the quarter. That's double digits now uh, for cloud in a quarter, which is kind of incredible. This was the eighth consecutive quarter uh, of the company seeing either flat or declining growth. And it's been declining seven quarters. It was flat uh, uh, for two consecutive quarters. Uh, any news or not here, Tom, uh, looking at uh, these numbers that we've seen so far? If the cloud growing revenue in the middle of a pandemic was news to you, I've got some other news you probably need to know about. Um, you know, I, I I'm glad to see that they're getting more successful. Amazon's growth being flat doesn't worry me because when you are the 920 pound gorilla, you're going to lose people, especially if your competitors are gaining. But I would be interested to see how cyclical that growth is if they lose customers this quarter and then they grow again two quarters from now when people swing workloads back their way. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see as, you know, uh, work from home orders and stuff like that, uh, uh, you know, over the course of many months, um, start to subside, people go back to work, what these numbers shake out to be, you know, there was a full month of kind of pandemic, you know, hashtag pandemic life uh, in these. Um, but really, I think that second quarter will be very indicative. Obviously, you know, I, I think this does show, uh, you know, kind of the use of Microsoft Teams paying dividends for Microsoft, uh, at least in this uh, situation. So um, we will we'll see if that continues. Although interesting, if Microsoft can continue to lead in terms of overall growth, being a strong number two, admittedly, again, like you said, uh, uh, AWS is the 800 pound gorilla. Uh, we will see, uh, uh, you know, if, if that can continue going forward. I have my doubts. Uh, next up here, um, the board of ICANN voted to reject the sale of the .org registry to Ethos Capital, saying concerns on how Ethos would use the registry to pay down the mere $300 million in debt the acquisition would actually require. The Internet Society currently manages the .org public internet regist or interest registry and announced plans for the sale back in November to a whole kerfuffle of controversy. The deal also faced scrutiny from California Attorney General uh, Javier Becerra, who uh, a letter was sent to ICANN that effectively delayed this vote a month, as well as several ICANN founding members. So stopping the sale here, Tom, news or not? It's news because finally somebody at the ICANN pulled their head out of the rear end and decided to do what they were supposed to do in the first place. All right, I get it. Funds and, and, and companies want to buy registries. Well, there's a reason why they want to buy them, folks. They want to sell them to other people, especially if, you know, as was brought up, you're going to spend $300 million on this. How are you going to make that money back? 
we don't know six months from now we have to start selling you information because we spent too much money buying something that quite honestly shouldn't be owned by anybody yeah it uh it just seemed i, I mean if, if from an optics perspective of nothing else it's one thing if it's to at least with a if even if you're a for-profit company at least if you have some sort of track record that people can say oh okay you know we can evaluate whether uh you know that's you know, if this is a trustworthy party in terms of, you know, the internet at large, but for a newly formed company, essentially, seemingly uh, with an inside track, kind of with some ICANN members in there, with some sort of political sketchiness, um, uh, it just seemed like the optics were wrong from the start and now uh, voted against, so not happening. Uh, next up here, Judge uh, uh, Lorna Schofield ruled that the U.S. FCC must provide copies of website logs related to the public comments made regarding the 2017 net neutrality rules appeal on the FCC's website. The ruling was in response to a Freedom of Information Act to request the logs by reporters, which the FCC refused to release, citing privacy concerns because there were IP addresses in there. The judge ruled that the agency didn't show how anyone would be harmed by releasing the IP addresses. Not to say that you couldn't be harmed by, I guess, having your IP address leaked, but that the FCC did not demonstrate that. And that the information would help to show if the whole uh, comment period could be vulnerable to corruption. There's been all sorts of false allegations out here regarding, you know, uh, possible DDoS attacks by net neutrality proponents uh, to take down the comment system and all sorts of rumors that there have been, you know, dark money groups posting these comments here. Uh, getting to see these logs now here, Tom, news or not? Let me uh, let me use one of my favorite phrases that I hear all the time about certain other things. If you don't have anything to hide, why don't you just release the logs? <laughs> you know, as it turns out, and and I'll I'll be fair about this. I personally do not like Ajit Pai. He and I disagree vin vehemently and fundamentally on a number of things. Mm -hmm. So to watch him get his comeuppance a little bit. From this whole, oh, well, you know, we got DDoSed because people are blah, 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 whatever. Then let's get to the bottom of it. If, if your comment system got DDoSed by people, then we need to figure out how to fix that. If the reason why your comment system stopped accepting comments suspiciously from people who were against something you were for, that says more about your character than it does about your comment system. Um, I just want answers. And, and if the answers mean that you're a piece of garbage that drinks out of a comically oversized mug that probably shouldn't, um, then then I like that answer. But if the answer is, is that your system is fundamentally broken and we need to upgrade it before you decide to start opening it to the world to comment about things, then then maybe we need to fix that too. Maybe we could sell your coffee mug to buy a new comment system. <laughs> All right. Uh, another thing that we need some truth on here, Tom. News or not, Intel confirmed it plans to acquire the transportation startup MoveIt, which is spelled M-O-O-V-I-T, don't approve, uh, which analyzes urban traffic patterns and provides transportation recommendations focused on public transit. Intel says the service uh, will be integrated into its existing, or it used to um, uh, augment the mobile eye mobility as a service, autonomous vehicle offering, and that they won't cut off service to any existing MoveIt customers. And I didn't realize, but they have an app with like 800 million users or something ridiculously. Like that intel investing in automation while competitors perhaps are forced to cut spending or at least r d tom news or no well i'd like to think that intel's taking the bull by the horns here but i don't really see how this is going to pay off it's it's a data source mm -hmm. but it's a data source of public transit so if you're going to feed your autonomous vehicle systems maps of where trains are going isn't the point of public transit to reduce the number of people that use cars <laughs> but on the other uh, i will play devil's advocate here who would be maybe a prime customer for vehicle automation maybe uh, you know buses above ground cars stuff like that uh, in public fleets and stuff like that might be an easy way to get some, you know, some customer wins and get some rollout uh, from that, especially when everybody else seems to be competing on, you know, automating people's individual cars. So maybe that's Intel's overall strategy. We will see. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you that, that their magnanimity of not shutting the service down had absolutely nothing to do with them wanting to be nice to the customers. They didn't want to get rid of their data sources. Yeah. <laughs> also, probably some revenue. It seemed like MoveIt was, uh, was, was doing pretty well for itself. Uh, next up here, Salesforce unveiled work.com, which is really just a redirect to salesforce.com slash work. But it uh, leads you to a suite of apps to help organizations manage the return to offices from COVID-19. Most of the components have yet to be released, but we know at least the overview of them uh, with the emergency response management platform available at launch. Other tools coming include a private contact tracing app uh, for organizations to deploy, employee wellness assessments, 
includes workforce reskilling and a workplace command center to kind of centralize information uh, related to employees and organizational health. Each component for work.com is alloc- as an a la carte paid service. I'm assuming you would get the command center to kind of start and then build off of that. But Tom, uh, Salesforce kind of expanding into this return to the workplace, news or not? It's news, but it's worrying news because I get the feeling that for the next eight months, this is going to be any all that anybody's going to want to sell me is, hey, buy our COVID-19 response kit per month, per user. Um, what, do, what do I get for it? Do, do, does it vaccinate my employees? Does it does it fix the? No, 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 no. It just lets you spy on them. Okay. Mm I do, at least the contact tracing thing, that does seem to be a trend where for lack of a, you know, something from the, the CDC or something like that, that a lot of private organizations are at least examining this. And certainly, uh, you know, Salesforce kind of sees a an opportunity there. I'm more surprised we don't see that for more infrastructure based companies as opposed to like a like a service over the top like that. But um, uh, I, I could definitely see a lot of organizations being interested in that, if nothing else. Yeah. And finally, here, the last story on news or not, uh, two kind of related stories kind of were, were mashing together. Microsoft opened registration for its virtual build conference, making registration free for all attendees. Kind of important because it was like $2,500, I think, last year. The event will feature opening remarks from CEO Satya Nadella, usual keynotes, uh, and a start of 48-hour workshops that will be streamed on Twitch. Meanwhile, Apple announced the first virtual WWDC Worldwide Developer Conference, for those of you not in the know, that will start on June 22nd and be free through its developer app and developer website. Uh, in the past, uh, this was a paid event. They actually had a lottery system to handle the demand, and it was, you know, obviously also uh, required some bags and bags of cash. So virtual developer conferences here. I'm not surprising. Not news that a an event is going virtual, but news that it's going free. Tom, news or not? That is news to me. Um, I but I'm also seeing that a lot of other conferences, whether it's Cisco or Cisco Live or VMworld or or any other places, they they're going free because they know that nobody's going to pay to do a virtual conference. They're also closing the number of days and or I'm sorry, reducing the number of days and things like that. Here's the kicker. So for years, you've had uh, people screaming that they couldn't get to WWDC because it was always sold out because they had a limited number of seats, artificially limited. Um, now you made it free and available online for everybody to watch. Yeah, you think you're going to be able to charge for this in 2021, <laughs> Apple? I'm sorry, but you you not only uh, shot the goose that laid the golden eggs, you buried the parts across the country because no one's going to want to pay to go to WWDC 21. I, I do wonder, though, you know, I do think $2,500, probably the market is not going to bear. Certainly wasn't going to bear that this year. But, you know, going forward, if the new normal is kind of the virtual event as standard and only the most, you know, exceptional uh, things that specifically require in-person, you know, contact, uh, uh, you know, we have physical events, at least for the for the next couple of years. I do wonder if maybe 2020, you know, maybe not even 2021, but 2022, there is a much lower cost. Um, to maybe get access to either a library of video content or something like that, um, uh, just to kind of put up some sort of some wall. I, I do wonder if that will be coming down the line, but uh, interesting. Yeah. All right, first up here on our discussion that I wanted to get into, um, NVIDIA announced another acquisition. They've kind of been on a, I, I don't want to say they've been on a spree because their last acquisition was announced 16 months ago and it just finally closed, but they announced that they intend to acquire Cumulus Networks, hopefully not taking quite as long as Mellanox. This comes on the heels of that Mellanox acquisition for just under $7 billion. In fact, the two companies presented together at Networking Field Day a few years ago, and they're part of uh, uh, the, I think, the OpenStack Alliance. They do OpenStack things together, uh, so there is a relationship there. The company gets the networking OS Cumulus Linux and a lot of credibility in the open networking space uh, outside of, and also some uh, analytics, uh, obviously, and support packages and stuff that Cumulus was offering. NVIDIA is clearly pivoting to the enterprise and the HPC space, Tom. How does the Cumulus acquisition kind of fit into that strategy? Well, this gives the NVIDIA people a great OS to put on Mellanox switches, one that was already there. As you mentioned, we, we got a great overview of them at Networking Field Day. They, they literally co-presented. Uh, my friend Pete Lumbus did a great job of kind of showing off what they're doing in the OS space. Now, that being said, this is Linux. It's just that Cumulus has added a lot of... Um, IP on the back end. They've, they've done a lot of work. And, and as Pete pointed out rightfully in a Reddit thread shortly after this announcement was uh, made, they're going to continue to contribute to the project. They're not just going to take their, their toys and go home. So I'm happy to hear that. I'm, I'm glad to see that they're going to contribute to this. 
this also means that they can pour a lot of development into Linux on a lot of other things too. This could consider, conceivably become like the standard OS for all Mellanox and NVIDIA stuff is, you know, running a version of Linux with a robust networking stack and, and other types of instrumentation built into it. Um, it's a good exit for Cumulus. I mean, you're building a network stack on a free operating system. Okay, I'm happy to see that. Uh, you know, JR and Dinesh, I think, have kind of left for greener pasture. I know JR Rivers has. I, I, I can't remember if Dinesh at Dutt is still there or not. Um, but ultimately, this is a good exit for them. They've got um, good oversight. They've got a path forward, and it doesn't feel like this is just going to get you know bought up and killed off. My question is, is this like another, uh, I guess, end around, around, you know, to kind of maybe kneecap uh, a company like Intel? And my thinking of this is, you know, right now this is this is great for open networking so you can, you know, install Cumulus Linux on a switch or something like that. And so even in a situation where it maybe is getting installed on Intel hardware, uh, they're now getting a, a situation where they can sell services and, and get a, a whole bunch of support packages kind of on top of that on the software side. And then potentially eventually, you know, I could see this also making sense of, hey, all of a sudden we're going to uh, either start making or we're going to buy an ASIC maker or, you know, um, uh, you know something uh, along those lines, you know, kind of get on the hardware side too which is where, you know, the company has kind of made its hay for decades now. Uh, I do wonder if that's maybe the other shoe to drop uh, on, as part of this as well. It wouldn't surprise me one bit. And when you consider that Intel bought Barefoot Networks, which is running ASICs and programmable P4 stuff and has been for a while, I mean, it's, I would, I would be, I would put money on that being the case. Yeah, Barefoot was like, I was thinking of this. I was like, oh, they should buy Barefoot. I was like, oh yeah, too late. <laughs> 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 it was a good idea until I already had it. Uh, next up here, a little bit of a security story here. Uh, Catalan Simpano at ZDNet, uh, who does just fantastic security work over there, reports that in the past 12 months, more than 1,000 documents mentioning ransomware as a credible and potential future risk for operations have been filed by companies to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. This includes uh, 743 that were filed in 2020 alone, and in comparison, 749 documents in total were filed with the SEC listing ransomware for all of 2018. Uh, in February 2018, the SEC published formal guidance asking companies to improve their disclosure of cybersecurity risk. You can kind of see that if you look uh, by year of how many documents kind of lists uh, ransomware as a threat, like in like 2015, admittedly ransomware was not on as many people's radars or, you know, you could say whether it should be or not, uh, but it was like 12 or something like that. And then it like escalates from there um, and is clearly uh, hitting new highs uh, in 2020. Um, and according to a report from the ransomware in response company Coveware, admittedly someone who has maybe an interest in this, ransomware ransoms in Q1 2020 uh, averaged $110,000, up from $10,000 a year ago, kind of showing a shift in targets and strategy for a lot of these companies. So Tom, um, I, I guess, given what we know of the ransomware landscape, surprised by any of this? And does it show a shift in focus maybe for a lot of these organizations from a security standpoint? Yeah, I mean, ransomware wouldn't be successful if it didn't work. And the fact that they've started targeting enterprises like, you know, Maersk was a huge target um, that got everything locked up. You can see that in the in the average amount being paid. It's because, you know, well, okay, so let's let's be fair. I, I'm a I'm a person. If my files get locked, no big deal. I've I've wiped my computer on several occasions. I have backups, but ultimately I ain't paying nobody, even if it's a hundred bucks. Too bad. I, I I will stand on principle to not pay you a hundred bucks because you wipe my computer. But a company that has legal fiduciary responsibility, has regulatory whatever, yeah, just write a check and make this problem go away. And then you fund the next 10 years of ransomware development. Um, because guess what? Yeah, they that's what they want. They want targets that they know will pay. It's like um uh, it's not unlike patent lawsuits. You don't target the people who are going to fight you tooth and nail. You don't sue Newegg. They will bleed you dry in court for decades just on the principle of things. They're like me. No, no, no. You go after companies that like the amount you're asking for is a rounding error. And they're like, you know what? Just write the guy a check and make him go away. 
Yeah, and it's also interesting that this is kind of at the same time that we're seeing, you know, increasingly targeting hospitals and that kind of stuff. Not mm -hmm. even, uh, you know, there was a rash I know in uh, Texas of uh, city governments were getting shut down as a result of this. And I don't even think that is necessarily endemic of where ransomware is going these days. But yeah, you're absolutely right for for companies where, yeah, a hundred, you know, one hundred ten thousand for your your school district is probably a lot of money. But for a Fortune five hundred or something like that, again, that's. That's like a percentage of uh, a license fee for something that they're already paying, so they can they can justify that in a lot of ways. And then, uh, given the the you know increasing um, uh, increasingly stringent kind of regulatory landscape we are for data, where not only do, do you have to uh, be able to you know delete data and you know the right to be forgotten and all of that with GDPR, but also the fact that you kind of have to know what you have and be able to access that at any given time to be in compliance. Um, certainly makes that, I think, an easy decision for a lot of people. Not to say it's, you know, I, I know a lot of people, you know, Tom, feel the same way as you do. Um, you can take, you can get my, my, I'll buy your encryption keys from my cold dead hands. That metaphor doesn't quite work. But uh, uh, clearly, uh, yeah, it is, it is working um, for some ransomware companies. So we will see. Yeah. Next up here, uh, uh, kind of some more uh, COVID-19 related stuff here. Uh, Nutanix uh, confirmed that they are furloughing about 25% of their staff, over 1,400 workers, setting uncertain conditions due to COVID-19. These will come in the form of two separate unpaid one-week furloughs, the first occurring May 4th uh, through July 26th. They're kind of rolling through this so that they don't have, you know, 25% of their staff just not there on, uh, for one week, followed by another round August 3rd through October 31st. The company says the research structure did not impact any customer service and are uh, designed to be temporary. They're not you know, going to be consistently doing this, um, presumably as uh, uh, the COVID-19 restrictions kind of ease up. Nutanix is uh, out of these, definitely out of the small startup phase, right? They're considered by some to be a, a unicorn uh, and, you know, certainly have gone public, but doesn't have nearly the financial muster of competitors like Dell EMC or HPE. This kind of goes back to what we we're talking about with Intel and their Move It acquisition and kind of how they're able to invest in something like that where other people have to scale back. It's kind of the opposite here, it feels like for Nutanix. Setting aside the human cost, which I don't want to de-emphasize, you know, it's it's horrible to have to lose, uh, you know, uh, you know, two paychecks uh, for a lot of these people. Uh, even if companies are in a similar position uh, that can weather the storm, and I don't think Nutanix necessarily right now is in an existential crisis, but certainly is making hard decisions. Will we see an R and D rut for these mid-sized players uh, kind of going forward? I think we will. I mean, where the money's got to come from somewhere, right? And you can't invest. If you are just trying to keep the lights on, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we saw such a huge response about this from the U.S. federal government. Um, the the situation that Nutanix finds themselves in is actually kind of interesting because I was thinking about this the other day. Um, they are basically the kid that just finished college and move out of home. You know, when you are at home, you are the unicorn startup. Somebody else is paying all of my bills. I can do pretty much whatever I want. Nobody expects anything out of me. If I fail, no big deal. I have a safety net to try this all over again. And then you go through some growing pains. College is basically trying to get your, your company funded or going public or, or whatever. It's like a whole bunch of blood, sweat, and tears and finding out that reality is a lot different than you expected. But now you're out on your own. You, you are making your own money. You have your own place. You, know, you don't have to go to mom to do your laundry. But you're not stable yet. You're not a 40 year old with, you know, a mortgage and a 401k and disposable income to, I don't know, buy a Harley Davidson or something. That's where Nutanix is. They can just make it, but they can't like, you know, go drop a billion dollars to buy some new technology or something like that. And I'm throwing random numbers out here. I really don't know. That's going to hurt because more than anything, those are the companies that are, are going to slowly grow and build and, and become the new giants. Well, you're basically kneecapping them right now. Um, I there People poked a little bit of fun at the fact that Nutanix was listed as cloud giant Nutanix um, in, in one of the news reports. And a lot that came to news of, you know, people who are familiar with AWS and well other cloud providers, um, except for Oracle, because they're not a giant at all. But the, the thing is, this ultimately is going to cost the next generation. You know, Dell, we've already seen it with IBM. IBM went from being the biggest tech company in the world to basically nothing now. And then you're on to, um, you know, Dell EMC and, and Cisco and those other companies. They're not going to be around forever. So who was going to come up to take their spot? Just like Cisco and Dell EMC took the spots from IBM. Well, it's got companies like Nutanix. And if they don't have the money to invest in people or product, 
they're not going to last very long. And I also think there is a, a this is also um, very damaging to them, their narrative as a company. You know, like you said, uh, you, you write te- you know, cloud giant in a, a, a news article or a blog post or something like that, because, you know, that, that's kind of the perception of this, you know, this very fast growing unicorn mm-hmm. company uh, kind of on the forefront of, you know, a lot of this, uh, you know, secondary storage and kind of uh, finding uses for that and kind of breaking down some of the old. Um, more traditional siloed methods and, you know, you know, yada, yada, yada. You can throw out all the buzzwords that you want, but there was a, there was a very positive narrative around that. And even just that perception of, okay, they're, they're going through some tough times. Listen, everybody's going through some tough times, but if I have to make a, you know, a purchasing decision, maybe in the back of my mind that does, you know, affect uh, whether I'm choosing them or I'm choosing a company, uh, you know, one of their competitors from maybe one of these companies seen as being, oh, these old, you know, uh, slower moving companies. But, you know, uh, if you have more confidence that, they're not feeling it quite as hard, at least yet. I, I think that could also be not just from an R and D standpoint, but from a from a customer growth uh, perspective, and kind of you know changing how people talk about the company. You know, maybe the next blog post doesn't say cloud giant; it says you know struggling, uh, <laughs> struggling yeah. size. You know, store you know software defined storage provider or something like that. Uh, that could that could definitely also have an impact. Um, and, it, and it's that's one of those things that's hard to quantify. Um, and we'll just we'll just have to see where the space is. I mean, the the good. I mean, not the good thing for anyone, but the reality is is that everyone is going to be struggling. Everyone's going to be feeling it. There probably aren't a lot of companies that are in a position to buy and invest. And and you know, uh, uh, that's part of the problem that they're having is they're not getting new customers. But the the market as a whole is slowing down. So it's not like their competitors are necessarily gaining this huge swath of customers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, always hate to see that, but, uh, you know, definitely was something that was in the news and uh, wanted to talk about it for sure. And then last here on the show, real quick, uh, there was uh, a, a bunch of servers that were coming out, uh, kind of a bunch of stories all together. We had to kind of group them together that uh, running the infrastructure management platform Salt have recently come under what appears to be a coordinated cyber attack with servers uh, of the mobile OS lineage OS and then the Node.js blogging platform Ghost successfully exploited. Uh, effectively, they didn't see any data loss, or at least they weren't reporting any data loss or anything like that. But that uh, the the attackers had installed a crypto miner on them. So you you did that, guys. Congratulations on the hack. Uh, according to security researchers, it looks like the attack uh, was using an automated vulnerability scanner to look for recently patched bugs. In fact, on May first, um, Saltworks had come out with a patch and uh, basically a critical advisement saying. You need to patch these right away. This is very severe. We believe that these will be actively exploited or that people know about them. Please patch. But within 24 hours, we were seeing these server outages. You know, Tom, I, I know the the motto for everything is patch all the things all the time, right? And I, I know there are a lot of reasons why you can't. But can we reasonably expect the, even the majority of organizations to be able to do that in 24 hours, even for a critical bug? No, we can't. And unfortunately, that's one of the problems. We've always hoped that responsible vulnerability disclosure means you tell the companies a month in advance, two months in advance, as far as in advance as you can, so that they have time to build the patch and get it rolled out so that when the disclosure happens, that you are protected. Well, that only works if the people who are doing the disclosures are actually like on the legit up and up. Um, When you get people who are nefarious enough to find these exploits and then hold them and and use them um you know 24 hours i don't even think i could patch my mac in 24 hours i've been trying to get firmware updated on my airpods for the last day and a half and that ain't happening so that and that's a consumer (laughs) system that's completely built out now i'm gonna have to go manually do it myself no thank you um I, i i don't know ultimately how this is going to work but something's gotta happen and Maybe the solution is, is we set up some kind of automated patching system or we have better control over how the patches are distributed and applied. But if we're going to start seeing, you know, sub 24 hour exploitation of vulnerabilities, relying on people to do this is not going to work because we will get swamped. Yeah, and, and I guess the silver lining, if there is one, is that because this was using an automated system, not just for detection, but for kind of deploying these exploits, is really the crypto. It seemed like the crypto miner was the only thing that they could do given that automation, right? They couldn't do anything more sophisticated. And since that time, they were able to take down the servers, patch, and get everything back up, looking like only down for a couple of hours. Admittedly, for for any company, that's kind of a disaster, worst case, uh, almost a worst case scenario, other than maybe losing data or something like that. But um, you know, if if 
these kind of automated exploits for now at least have a limited amount of damage that they can do. That's a little bit of a silver lining. It's not much, but yeah, really bad to uh, to see that turned around so quick. Kind of, you know, I, I, reading all the details about this, I just kind of had my sympathies for like the security team on there. It's like, what could you, you know, like if, if you happened to be asleep at the wrong time and didn't see this, uh, you were you were kind of SOL. And uh, yeah, that it uh, a tough ticket. We will we will see how the industry responds. Um, but I will respond with nothing but appreciation for my co-host, Tom Hollingsworth, because we are at the end of the Gestalt IT Rundown. Tom, thank you so much for being here. Where can people find more of your great stuff if they're so inclined? Well, the best place to find the stuff that I've been writing recently is to head over to gestaltit.com. Um, I have been uh, producing a little bit of content here and there, um, <laughs> published a couple of posts. Um, speaking of which, if you are a fan of listening to me drone on and on and on, um, I have a new video coming out tomorrow, uh, Conversations Episode 2, covering Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E, including some of the different the decisions from my friend Ajit Pai about opening up some spectrum. I'll say this, he at least got that right. <laughs> All right. And you can find more of my stuff on gestaltit.com as well. And uh, be sure, if you haven't already, if you're not watching this on YouTube, uh, and even if you are, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash gestalt IT video. And we have all sorts of, we have conversations coming up. We have new video series coming out. You can check this show out. You'll get notified when we go live. So you can watch us live every Wednesday at 1230 p.m. Eastern time. You can also like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash gestalt IT for that as well. Uh, but until uh, the next time we meet, uh, for myself, for Tom Hollingsworth, for all of us here, in the Gestalt IT family, here's wishing you and yours to have a super sparkly day.